Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Eugene Peterson. I'm the chair of the Anne Arundel County Human Relations Commission, and we're uh, pleased to have everybody uh, who is on board listening to our commission meeting today via Zoom and Anne Arundel TV. Uh, the Human Relations Commission is uh, charged by statute with investigating uh, charges of housing discrimination. And uh, if you feel you have been discriminated in terms of housing, you can go on the county website, look us up, and we have a form that you can fill out. And uh, we will uh, then take a look at your uh, alleged uh, complaint. Uh, alleged, uh, I mean, your complaint and the alleged uh, 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 discrimination that, that you're filing for. Uh, we also have a charge, a general charge, of uh, uh, increasing uh, human relations in the county and countering uh, uh, discrimination in all forms in Anne Arundel County. Um, we don't have uh, subpoena power to hear alleged discrimination issues, but we do have subpoena power and we do have uh, a hearing power to hear housing uh, uh, complaint uh, issues. We uh, are in the county charter. That was something that the county council and county executive uh, Stuart Pittman um, put before the voters and the voters agreed that we should uh, put the council, uh, the commission in the county charter so that it would not uh, be subject to the whims of any county uh, executive who could appoint or not appoint a commission by executive order. And uh, we thank uh, the county citizens for agreeing with that position. Um, I'd like to uh, call the meeting to order at 6.02 uh, p.m. June 17th. And um, at this point in time, um, I'd ask uh, our secretary, I believe she's, she's on uh, the uh, uh, Zoom uh, uh, by call today, Mary Daydoni. Uh, Mary, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. And um, we will wait a couple of minutes because I don't think we have a quorum yet, do we, Mary? Um, we have five uh, members, of, five commissioners present. Oh, we um, do have? We have, and with the vacancies in the commission five, I believe constitutes a quorum. I want to check with Commissioner Gaston if that is true. What's the total number that we have um, active mm -hmm. numbers without the, without the vacancies? Um, without the vacancies, 11. I'm sorry, including vacancies, I'm sorry. So we have how many vacancies? Uh, 11, 11 commissioners um, are mandated. Um, that That's what the legislation says, that there will be 11 commissioners. We have five present. I believe we have at least one vacancy, um, actually, at two yeah. vacancies. Yeah. We have two vacancies? Yeah, and we have, we have. Um, so we have a quorum then, if we have two vacancies, that means we have yeah. nine, and we have five people here, so we're gonna. Right. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And then for the sake of um, the audio record, I will call the names of those uh, commissioners present that I can see from the Zoom screen are present. And I'll ask you to just say your name or yes. Um, Commissioner Faye Gaston. Present. Commissioner Eugene Peterson. Present. This is Commissioner Mary Didoni speaking. Commissioner Joseph Clapsaddle. On mute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Commissioner Clapsaddle, may I ask you to unmute and speak again? Thank you. Hello, I'm here and ready to do business. Thank you. Commissioner Jaquela Call. Present. Thank you very much. We have excused absences for Commissioner Lakeisha Hatcher and for Commissioner Mark After. Oh, um, we, there's one additional issue, um, and I have to ask Commissioner Call. Uh, Commissioner Call, have you, have you gotten a letter um, yet from the county that makes you a full voting member? No, I have not. Okay. So then we do not have a, then we don't have a, we don't have a quorum. Well, let me, that's,
takes us down to eight um, active commissioners and we have four commissioners present. I turn to Commissioner Gaston again. So we, so we actually have nine, nine commissioners and eight. We have nine commissioners because, because we have two vacancies, correct? Well, yeah, we have one non-voting commissioner that has the yeah. So we, we have, have two eight. Vacancies. We have two vacancies. Three. Okay. Oh, three? Okay. Yeah, if, uh, if uh, Commissioner Carl right. has been officially appointed, then that counts as a vacancy as well. Okay, we're good. All right. If my math is correct. We have four of eight appointed commissioners. All right, thank you. <laughs> and we'll probably have some more join us as we go along. Okay, um, why don't we go to, uh, everybody has seen the minutes. I'd like to ask uh, for approval of the minutes. And if there are any changes that would be recommended, you can send them to, uh, uh, if they're if there's substantial corrections, then we 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 can't approve them. But if they're just minimal corrections, spelling and whatnot, um, you can forward them to uh, Commissioner Day Doney. Anybody have any uh, problem with approving the minutes of May twenty? I move that the minutes be approved. Is there a second? Thank I you, second. Commissioner. Butler. Pardon? I second it. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Gaston. Uh, it's been uh, uh, motioned and, uh, and uh, seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Fine. Now, aye. pardon? It was a late aye. I had trouble okay. unmuting. That's good. That's good. Um, now I'd like to go to our uh, presentation. Um, and I'd like to ask, uh, uh, the County Police Chief, uh, Chief Awood, to uh, uh, take over this part of the agenda. And uh, we're going to have two items that we're going to be looking at. Uh, Chief Awood's going to talk to us about the challenges and opportunities uh, that present themselves with the uh, reforming and changing of the law enforcement uh, officer's bill of rights that happened in the legislative past legislative session and uh, major goodwin will update us on the uh, information that i sent you uh, on the year uh, look at uh, hate bias uh, statistics so chief take it away thank you mr peterson hello to everyone this evening um I wish, I certainly wish I had more to, uh, more information to provide here tonight. Um, just let me pause for one moment, bear with me, I'm catching up. All right, good to be going, sorry about that. Um, okay. So, as you know, um, this legislative, last legislative um, session, there were several bills um, that were passed that impact um, policing in the state of Maryland. Um, some of which uh, are scheduled to um, go live October 1 of this year, and the others, predominantly HB 670, um, begin on July 1 of 2022. Um, just so that you all are aware, um, I, as my co command staff, we're all members of the Maryland Police um, Chiefs Association. Um, and uh, we've all gotten together with the Maryland um, Police uh, Chiefs Association and Maryland Sheriff's Association um, this month. Uh, they've been hosting listening sessions and discussions um, throughout the state. Um, and intend to continue with all of our um, public safety partners throughout the state um, for the month of June. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. And the goal for all of us um, is to one, comply with the law by the dates um, indicated, but also um, to do it in such a manner that I do believe the legislature intended um, to have uniformity of 
between all of the law enforcement departments um, throughout the state versus what I've heard and some others you've probably heard that you know some jurisdictions do things one way and another jurisdiction may not do the same. So um, this is our opportunity to do it right, get it right as a state um, throughout all of our uh, public safety partners in the state. So as you know, there are a number of changes um, that impact um, all law enforcement agencies, but also the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission um, and our local governments. Um, so next month, I know the focus uh, will be deeper dives. Right now we're sorting through the bills, um, but deeper dives and creating action items like on things we can move uh, to by October 1 is as a collective. So, um, so far this department, our leadership has participated again in four of those um, sessions just so that we could all um, become better informed. We've all read read the bills, but it's a lot. There are a lot of a lot of changes. Um, and again, um, you know, it's going to impact chiefs, sheriffs, um, executive level folks, legal advisors, uh, our training directors, our policy writers, our policy managers. Um, so uh, we're all invested. Um, and although it is a lot, we intend to, you know, do what we have to do to make sure that, that we meet we meet both of those um, deliverable dates. Um, as you know, uh, one of the larger issues that's come up um, has been body-worn camera. Um, and although by law now we're required to um, implement a program by 2023, we're, we're there right now, right? So um, I think we're almost completed with preliminary training of like trainer trainers. Um, and I think training will, will pretty much be completed early July. And by mid-July, we'll have, as you've heard us say, um, those first 100 body cameras on our officers. Um, and we have our projected timeline of get, getting everybody equipped with their body-worn cameras um, is from July to October, where the entire department will be equipped with body-worn body cameras. And I know that was a uh, large discussion amongst legislators and um, everyone throughout the state. So we're, we're happy to report that we're ahead of um, the required timeline for that. Um, another thing for October, I can just go over briefly a couple of the things that are um, required for October and some of the things we're already doing. Um, but uh, by October 1, um, there's a prohibition on uh, military surplus equipment, weaponized equipment. We don't um, take any equipment from that program, the 1033 program. Um, the independent investigative unit is out of our hands. Uh, the attorney general's office has been tasked with standing that up anytime there's a death related uh, police involved death, whether it's an author, officer involved shooting or an in custody death, um, the state is now mandating that this independent investigative unit out of the attorney general's office um, conduct the investigation. We have concerns with that. Um, not necessarily the creation of that unit, but um, this is a large state and we don't, we can't predict how many incidents will um, occur in, in one day. Um, but if they have to respond statewide, we're, we're hopeful that they'll have the appropriate um, staffing and funding to be able to carry out their duties um, in a timely fashion because we'll, we'll be maintaining scenes for, you know, we don't know how long. So that's just a concern that, that's popped up for us um, right now, preliminarily. But again, I know that, um, you know, when tasked, we rise to the occasion and we'll, we'll make it happen. But that's just a concern for right now. Something to think about. Um, with regard to no-knock warrants, um, there are changes uh, to the, to the uh, uh, requirements for um, supervisory review and writing, um, and then uh, concurrence with the uh, state's attorney. That's something we already do. We, a supervisor signs, um, a command officer signs, and then the state's attorney signs. Um, and then there, you know, the changes of the hours um, where you can uh, perform a no-knock warrant. Um, in the event there are exigent circumstances, 
you know, you can go outside of that time frame, but there are other requirements throughout throughout that piece of legislation, reporting requirements and such um, that, that are new. Um, and then the other big one was the um, MPIA, so Anton's Law. Um, the change is uh, redefining what is a personnel record. Um, in the past, an investigative record um, related to an administrative or criminal matter um, was part of a personnel record that is not releasable. Um, the only exception now would be um, during open active investigations, and that's something that uh, we have our legal advisor and um, our custodian, our records custodian, reviewing right now. Um, and again, for consistency throughout the state, they're talking to their peers as well, because again, we want to make sure we, we do it right. Um, not just as Anne Arundel County, but all of our, you know, partners throughout the state, all our law enforcement partners throughout the state. Um, then July 1, 2022, that's where a lot of the, the major requirements um, come in. The biggest ones are the body worn cameras, um, the use of force changing uh, from the um, reasonable uh, standard to um, necessary and proportional. Um, it's going to take some navigating through that because the definitions aren't clear. It's going to take additional conversations with the legislature. But once again, um, you know, we'll be prepared to implement by July 1, 2022. Um, I'm just looking at some of the larger, um, the police accountability boards. You all know that that is something that will be stood up by each um, uh, county's uh, chief executive officer, that's the county uh, executive. Um, and in our case, he will appoint um, the members and then those members, uh, the chair of that board um, appoints, I believe the chair or serves as a chair on the administrative charging committee. And then the county exec appoints to both citizens and then the chair appoints to citizens. And then administrative hearing board um, will be comprised of administrative law judges, either active or retired. Um, there's some concern for, you know, what that's going to look like in terms of staffing availability, uh, not um, uh, necessarily that they're not available. It's just sometimes they're sitting on um, cases where a judge may not be present. So um, we're all, again, looking at this through a lens of um, we're going to get this done, um, but we still have our concerns, um, you know, because of course, you know, with the implementation of all of these new things, there, there's going to be a budgetary cost attached. So we have to figure all of that stuff out. Um, but we've got time before July 1, 2022. And then the, I'm just looking at some of the things that we already do do. Um, So just for example, the early intervention system, we have that in place. The employee assistance program, we have that in place. Um, with regard to, I just went over administrative hearing boards, et cetera, with you all. Um, victims rights advocacy, we have that stuff in place. I'm not gonna go through everything, but um, the good thing is, is enough of those um, requirements we do have in place. And I just wanted to, um, let you know that um, we've also been having conversations internally with our officers, letting them know that, you know, we're still navigating through this. Um, there's no cause for uh, alarm. Um, stay the course with us. Obviously, um, there are concerns within the rank and file, um, rightfully so. Um, but we, um, you know, we intend to keep them updated as we learn more and as we begin implementation. Um, we'll certainly keep them apprised, but you as well, so that you know what progress, the community as well, you know what progress we've made um, as not just an agency, but a collective throughout the state. Because again, I do believe the intent is to have consistency and uniformity. We've had these conversations leading up to um, the le legislative session about how important it is to make sure we're all operating pretty much from the same framework. And then, um, I know that there are probably conversations that need to occur between MML and um, MAKO. 
and you know that's a little outside of my my purview i can do what i can do within my you know my sphere um but uh, i'm more than certain some mml more than municipalities have some concerns because essentially the police accountability boards are established by the county and when you look at a county like prince george's county that has several municipalities um, you're talking at least 24 municipal police departments that essentially will be held accountable by the county versus their own respective um, incorporated jurisdictions. So I imagine there may be some concern um, for the municipalities, and we have two here in Anne Arundel County. Um, but I think that you know it's important that they, um, if they haven't given voice, they give voice so that they understand, um, you know, exactly what's required of them. Um, and I'm sure they'll want to be engaged too, especially when you're talking about um, officers who work for their police departments. I'm not their chief of police. They have their own form of government, their own chief of police. So um, I know there are additional conversations that, that need to be had, but again, um, all of us uh, are on the same page in terms of, you know, we know we what we have to do um, and we're going to move forward with getting it done, but we're going to do it in a fashion where we're all on the same page. And when I'm saying same page, not just within Anne Arundel County statewide. So that's all I have for now. When I know more, I'll share more um, with everyone. And I know that the major good ones up next with the uh, hate bias information. If, so if, I, if I could uh, uh, ask any of the commissioners if they have any questions uh, in terms of the presentation from uh, Chief Abud. I don't, I don't hear any. I guess uh, my, my, I have one question, Chief, which is um, uh, the standards for the change in the use of force. Um, that's got to be a collaboration between um, the Police Chiefs Association and the legislature at this point in time. Is that not correct? And what role would a county executive play in that? And the Maryland, truly the Maryland um, Police uh, Training Commission also, because right. um, they Training and Standards Commission. So yes, I'm assuming they will provide the uh, framework um, that that regulates, um, you know, how we respond. It don't have to be uh, codified in coma um, in terms of how officers respond. But the other thought is um, beyond the, beyond the regulation um, within the law is you know our policies are going to have to change and our training we're going to have to retrain our officers so it's you know a good thing that we have time because that that's going to take time um to one um change the standard um to uh, set policy and free train right that makes sense yes and i guess the other issue um that i have concern about is costs because you're talking about training your your whole police uh, department. How many officers do you have, including yourself? <laughs> right now, we're teetering around 775. That number okay. is kind of going down a little bit here or there, but we're, we're, we're working on maintaining. Right, so that means that all of those officers will have to go through a use of force training and uh, be certified uh, through a process, and that's not going to happen overnight. I assume that's going to be a process that might take a while. Uh, and just to be quite frank with you, um, I, I formerly sat on the Maryland Police Training Commission um, and the composition of the commission is changing effective July 1, 2022. So the current commission is responsible for, and just in conversations with them, I know that they have 28 moving pieces that within the legislation that they're tasked with um, and they've transitioned from you know, a commission that is advisory or regulatory to, they have enforcement authority. Um, and so it's, you know, how do we accomplish this with this time frame? And yeah, what what is it gonna cost? And who's gonna be a part of all of that work? Because when you, there's one thing to discuss commission members, board members, it's another thing to discuss staffing. And I can't speak for his staffing levels, I'm speaking uh, about the director of the Maryland Police Training um, and Standards Commission, um, but I know that he does not have an extensive staff. So it's it's going to take a collective effort. We're the police chiefs and the police um, 
the sheriffs are going to have to step up um, to help MPTSC um, build this up. Well, thank you. That's been very uh, uh, useful in terms of outlining both the opportunities and the challenges that uh, we'll be facing as we move in this next uh, phase of uh, uh, police uh, uh, department reform. And, and I, I'm gra grateful that you welcome it. And um, there's one last thing um, that I would ask you to speak on, which you haven't personally spoken on, but others of your staff have, which is your um, emphasis on community policing and how you see that work in Ann Arbor County. So I will say, you know, I worked here in 2013 and 2014, and I had an opportunity to learn about this police department then, and I was impressed with this police department then. Are we a perfect agency? Absolutely not. Can we hold our officers accountable? Absolutely. Um, so uh, coming back, it was, uh, to me, a blessing. I'm happy to be back um, representing a very, what I know to be a professional agency. And I'll say this, um, we are one of very few agencies that are accredited by the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies. And we recently had our on-site review. It occurs every four years. And in between those four years, every year, there's an, um, a virtual assessment, right? So. Before they left, we had a meeting amongst command staff and those um, commissioners. And I'm going to, if I misquote, I know Major Goodwin's going to check me on this. Um, but one of their parting um, statements was within the 5% of the 18,000 police departments that are accredited, and we've been since the 90s, that means we're adhering to hundreds of standards, professional standards established by them. Of the 5% of agencies that participate um, in this process, more agencies need to be in police work like Anne Arundel. And I know I screwed that up, right, Major Goodwin? <laughs> I was close. I was close. They said we need, we need more Anne Arundels. That's, what, That's they what they said. We need more Anne Arundels. That's what they said. Yeah. So also, you know, when I got here, you know, I had to and I'm speaking the second time around. Obviously, I had to put my eyes on things. And uh, as they've described, um, I, I was drinking through a water hose. Um, sometimes it still feels like that. But um, taking in a lot of information, just learning, watching, observing, um, and growing to appreciate the work that we do do in terms of crime fighting, in terms of uh, community policing. Um, and in terms of our communication, I realize we could do a better job, and we're working on that. Um, but those were our three areas of focus, community policing, uh, cri um, uh, crisis intervention, um, because in the midst of the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, we've seen an increase in our calls for service in terms of emergency petitions, et cetera, um, and attempts on you know, suicides, et cetera, and suicides that have been carried out. Um, and then communications are, we have a huge platform by way of social media, we have a website, but Sometimes our communication could be a little better. And it's improved um, since uh, we've all been here, um, but we could, we could still do a better job of getting information out to everybody. So we're exploring opportunities as to how we can do that, but I think we've, we've improved some. So you know um, we created a Community Services Bureau. I think I shared with you before, you know, we had the three bureaus, patrol, operations, and then administration. Well, right now is the time, I believe, um, you know, where we invest in community engagement, community services, community policing. And so we created a bureau. We're still building it out. We just appointed a major. We just appointed a captain. We have some staff. We want to put more staff in there um, so that we're able to get into communities and really um, extend that olive branch and build relationships. And I think we do a good job, but I know we can do exceptionally well as we build out our community services bureau. Does that answer your question? Certainly does. Um... And I thank you for giving us uh, your time, which is valuable time, um, and uh, giving us a, a real look at uh, a lot of issues that you're facing, the department's facing, and especially the issues, again, surrounding uh, uh, police uh, reform and, and uh, how you see uh, the department moving forward. So, um, again, Commissioner thank Peterson? you so much. Yes. Um, Commissioner Clapsaddle has had his hand raised. Oh, okay, I'm raised. sorry. Commissioner Clapsaddle? 
And Chief Awad, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you once again for both of your uh, times with us in the commission. But I wanted to especially um, call your attention to uh, our meeting last month when we had Derek Matthews and Lieutenant Cox here. They did a really good job of explaining this whole body camera thing. Um, I'm still concerned a little bit about the integrity of this system, and I think that will, 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 in time, we'll be able to see what issues there are. But I wanted you to know that they did a good job and they gave us resources uh, that we could go to, and I appreciated that very much. Did, when, when you spoke with them, did they have the vendor Axon on the line as well? When you say you have concerns with the integrity of the system, are you speaking to the vendor? Or are you speaking to the process? The process. The okay. vendor was not on the phone. Okay. So you, you've read our policy? Yes. Okay. You, you'll let me know what your concerns are. I will. Okay. I have none now. But I <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no. Okay. I'll send you a message. Thank you. I appreciate that feedback. And it's important for us to hear that. So, um, and with that, sir, Mr. Peterson, do you have yes. anything further from me? No, I do not, Chief. All right. Well, you're about to be wowed by Major Katie Goodwin. So I'll mute my microphone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I don't know, Chief. You're a tough act to follow. Um, so as you guys know, I, I supply you with lots of data every month. Um, and I think I hope I clarified it with my last email to you, Mr. Peterson, the two sets of data that I provide you. The one set um, is, is the officer's reports that we take for hate bias crimes and hate bias incidents. Um, so anytime an officer goes out and if a derogatory word is used, but there was no crime associated with it, we still take a police report on that and we capture that as a statistic. When our central records folks looks at all of our reports, it has to meet the UCR, which is the Uniform Crime Report, the federal standards of what a hate crime incident is. So a lot of times what we take a report on doesn't meet that definition. So what gets reported to the state, the numbers aren't gonna be always the same, but we find it important to know also what our hate crimes are and what the hate incidences are. So we capture both, um, which I've explained our policy um, in depth at, at several of our meetings and how seriously we take it. So the reports that you see that our, our officers take, we're up to about 41 reports. Um, and this was just last week's statistics that I provided to you of officers that have taken reports. And then what we've reported to the state thus far from January until May of this year have been uh, 23. So you can kind of see how they weeded out. So again, those incidents, I, I've sent you a little kind of snapshot of a little blurb of what those incidents are. So when you see an incident where it's one neighbor calling another neighbor a derogatory word or one customer calling another customer standing in line, it gets into a little bit of an argument calling a derogatory word. Even though we take a report on that, that doesn't go to the state as being classified as an actual hate bias crime or incident, but we still find it important because it's an issue and we can't address it unless we know where our issues are. So which is why we still take those reports. Um, but looking at just the ones that reported to the state of those 23, no surprise, it's usually the verbal intimidations are our highest ones that are reported, which were 20 incidents. Um, there was two assaults so far and then one vandalism. Um, so those were all reported to the state. I'll let you guys know, we haven't seen the 2020 report from the state, but I can tell you our numbers are gonna be lower than what we saw in 2019. Um, my guess and my assumption is, is because with schools being out due to COVID, remember what I briefed out on our 2019 uh, state report, where 30%, over 30% of our incidents are school related or happen in the schools. Obviously with COVID and schools being out, um, that brought our numbers down because we didn't have as many reportable incidents. Um, so that's kind of the, the big view of, of what we look at. I know I gave you the data, hopefully people had time to look at it and digest it a little bit. Most of our hate bias incidents um, are race related. So of the 23 that we reported, 22 were race related. There was one sexual orientation that we uh, have reported so far for the year. Uh, the good news is um, right before COVID, the Office of Attorney General started a hate crimes task force, which I became a member of. Um, we had about five meetings before COVID hit, and then we had to stop doing the meetings. And um, just recently, they've restarted it again. We had our first meeting just two weeks ago. So we're getting that going, which is an important meeting. So it's a bunch of attorneys, it's the 
attorney general's office, their legislatures, delegates, and then police departments all kind of on this task force. And it's just a brainstorming idea of how we can try to combat this. Um, the biggest trend right now that we're seeing nationally is the hate crimes uh, towards Asians. Um, our county hasn't seen that. Um, not really a huge surprise because our population of Asians is that high in the county. We've had one incident so far for this year. In the last three years, we've averaged about one or two incidents involving Asians. So it wasn't a surprise not to see it in that. But the interesting thing that the OAG's office pointed out to the task force is about Anne Arundel County specifically. And I know I've talked to you guys about how important it is for us and how we report it and how we respond to these incidents. They acknowledge that in front of this task force about how Anne Arundel County takes it so seriously and how we report it and that we should actually be applauded because we are very honest about our reporting and that other agencies should kind of follow suit on that. So we were recognized in that task force at the last meeting, which was nice to see. Um, so we're still working hard at it. Um, we've partnered up, I've told you before, with the Conflict Resolution Center for the county. We refer to so those incidents, a lot of them stem from those neighbor complaints where it's a silly thing that they start fighting over. They left, left trash in their neighbor's yard or they left mail or they've done something to each other and then it escalates into that name calling that becomes derogatory. And that's what we see a lot in Anne Arundel County. Those cases where there's no crime involved but there's heated tension between two neighbors is starting to escalate, which is not what we wanna see. We really try to take those cases and refer them to conflict resolution where we bring both sides of the party to just a unbiased mediator who brings both parties in and tries to make them both understand where they're at and how they can kind of move forward in a healthier direction um, with not using language like that and kind of use it as an educational piece also about the words that they're using and why that's hurtful. Um, so that's working out really well. We have referred um, several of those cases to conflict me uh, mediation uh, with Miss Georgia Noon, which most of you know. So that's been working out really well. Um, so it's really kind of the updates that I have, and I'll leave it open to all of you if you have a question or concern with any of the stats that you've seen. Any commissioners have any questions or concerns? Okay, I don't see any hands. Or um, the only other question I would have, and you may or may not know this, if there's a decrease because of COVID in the schools and in general with these hate bias, is there an increase in domestic violence? Yes, we have seen an increase in domestic violence. And that really should not be a shocker. People were forced to stay home this last year, um, especially when uh, they closed businesses and restaurants down. A lot more people were staying at home. So we did definitely see an uptick in domestic violence, which was not a shock to us. And it wasn't just in our county. That was regionally um, yeah. with the state shutdowns and the stay at home orders. People are forced to stay in the house and you know now they're drinking alcohol and they're around each other more often and tensions are high. People are losing their jobs. And it goes hand in hand with what we've seen with mobile crisis and the mental health aspect of it. Those cases and the amount of emergency petitions that our officers are doing have escalated. My guess is a lot of it has to do with COVID also. With COVID, people lost their jobs, comes depression, the angst, the anxiety, that all goes hand in hand. So yes, we saw the increase in the emergency petitions that our officers have been having to do. What are our CIT officers and mobile crisis have had to respond to, their numbers have gone through the roof where We've had to increase the staffing in that unit with CIT. Um, and I know uh, the chief, we just got good news that that was approved in our budget where the county executive gave us four more officers in CIT. Um, and that's huge. I mean, that was well needed. And I can tell you whether that was approved or not, the chief was going to keep those four officers, those edited officers in CIT, um, because we're needed. They, they are running calls to calls to calls. And I, God help them, I don't know how they're doing it to keep up with that. Um, so yeah, COVID has, has impacted those areas and that social society issues with the domestic violence, the uh, mental health. It's, uh, it's taken a toll. It really has. It's been a lot. Well, uh, thank you, Major, as usual, for a very uh, precise and detailed presentation, as you always give. And um, thanks so much for uh, all of uh, you that are present from the department on the call for uh, being here to uh, continue to inform us about the activities with the department. And um, uh, 
Uh, you're welcome to stay on for uh, the rest of our meeting or I know you're busy, so go off and uh, probably get some sleep, I would think would be a good idea because I know you work very hard. So thank all of you uh, for your uh, help and involvement. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. You're thank welcome. you. Always good seeing you all. Thank you, commissioners. Thank, thank you very much. Good night, well, police department. Good night. <laughs> Appreciate you guys. All right. Appreciate you all. Thank you. Good night. All right. Good night. Good night. Now we'll go to uh, uh, commission uh, updates and reports and uh, uh, interim HRO Ridgeway will give us a report. <laughs> Hi, Joelle. Good evening, everyone. I'm sorry that I uh, missed last month, but I can uh, happy to report that I had a great time um, in Sedona. So <laughs> <laughs> I heard You're Kelly. Right. Kelly did great. So I'm grateful to her and um, to all of you for um, being understanding about me missing the meeting. Um, in terms of follow up that I have from last month, um, I did want to report you you probably recall that it was reported that there was a fair housing complaint filed in May. Um, <clears throat> the process is, is that the human relations officer reviews the complaint and makes a determination whether the complaint, um, whether there's cause um, in terms of uh, discrimination in fair housing. The complaint was filed by a mother who is also the real estate agent um, of an adult daughter who on in, in the report, the mother um, indicates that the daughter could is able to file her own complaint. Ultimately, I dismissed it and asked that her daughter file the complaint if she would want to file it. Um, if we proceed with a complaint, it goes to the Human Relations Commission where there could be where there will be a hearing. Um, and I felt it was really important for, um, for this person to want to engage in that kind of um, activity based on a claim of discrimination made on her behalf. Um, so she did file the complaint. She, re she filed the complaint herself on June 11th. Um, so I'll be working through that and um, just making sure that it fits under our fair housing law and it's something that you all could hear um, and then we'll move forward with it. So I will give you an update probably before the next meeting. Um, I have to make a decision within 30 days of receipt of the complaint and so that is by July 6th. So I imagine you'll hear something for, from me um, in the next week or so. Well, one question I have is, uh... We can have a hearing, but we don't have any hearing uh, regulations or rules right now. So how we have a draft go? that Kelly and I are going to meet with the Office of Law on Monday to make sure that they, you know, fit. You know, there there really are some things that are like left out in the code. Um, like, for example, um, when this complaint came in originally, um, it requires that I notify the respondents. Right, so the people that are being accused of um, discrimination. It does not say in the process whether taking this a statement or collecting information from the accused or respondents as part of my review of the incident, um, and whether that it's really just about me lining it up with the code to say this. Sure, this this claim falls under discrimination in housing based on race and familial status, which is what the um, which is what the complaint alleges. So, um, so we're just working through to put those to to put those layers in because the code is not really clear about how this process should go. It's it's actually pretty vague. So after next week. What I hope to do is after we have a solid draft with the Office of Law, um, I will send it to all of you um, to look at. I would imagine that by ne at next month's meeting, you probably will want to take a vote on the procedures 
because you will be in a situation where you're going to have to likely implement the procedures. So I think I think we can have procedures by next month for you, at least, you know, ahead of next month's meeting so that you have time to review them, maybe do some communication over email about, um, you know, changes, recommendations, et cetera. Thank you. That's a very useful information. I appreciate it. Okay. That. You're welcome. Um, you saw that the county executive has recognized Juneteenth as a, um, a county holiday for tomorrow. And I saw that it is a federal holiday also. Yes, it so is. I just wanted to acknowledge that um, and the, the, the special recognition that goes along with um, honoring that day. I also just want to remind people if anybody still needs to do their ethics financial disclosure forms, I tried to reach out to them, um, but Gina was off. So if there is anybody that hasn't gotten their financial disclosure form to the ethics commission, um, just a friendly reminder to do that. And if you need the form or anything, please let Eugene or I know. Could, could you send out a, a formal uh, sure. response? Sure, happy to. Okay. Yep. It's I'll just send it to the whole group um, yes. and you can ignore it if it doesn't apply right. to you. All right. Um, I'm sure you saw the press release, but the county has hired a uh, director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, Richard H., he goes by the name of Pete Hill. I believe that he starts next week. Um, so I was fortunate enough, and I, I think Eugene was too, to sit on the panel um, that got to hear from the two final candidates that Mr. Hill selected, did a very impressive um, presentation, and I, I think that he is going to do a great job as a, you know, in this new position. Um, so I'm looking forward to working with him. Um, the HRO and the EEO, EEO officer, um, what I'm filling in for right now, I believe that they're doing second interviews. So myself, Kelly, and Dr. K did the first round interviews and Mr. Hill and others participated in second round interviews. And I expect we'll hear shortly who, um, who they've asked um, to fill that position. So I'll keep you posted. In terms of the police reports, as Katie said, I think I try to say this every month, the police reports that I get, um, the, the vast majority of them are these, um, these reports documenting hate, bias, discrimination, et cetera, in the community. Many of them um, don't rise to the level of a crime being committed. Um, it is just people using terrible language um, toward one another and other people. Um, so I received, and so they do a great job sending those to me. I received 12 for the month of May. Um, eight of them were police information. So a lot of times those are, um, somebody calls to say, I want to report that this person called me X, Y, or Z, um, or some sort of verbal altercation between people um, that rises to the level of using derogatory language. Um, there was one um, of larceny and theft. There was one verbal threat, one assault, and one disorderly conduct. <clears throat> um, in terms of the complaints and inquiries that came to the HRO office for the month of May, I received five calls um, for information one of them was a fair housing complaint, which we already talked about. Um, the other four inquir were inquiries. Um, people really look just looking for resources um, based on a, a housing situation. Um, a lot of it is landlord tenant issue um, about leases and um, things like that. I had one um, where we were actually served paperwork from an attorney's office for an employment matter that um, isn't, the person does not work for the county. Um, I think the, the law, the, the firm that sent it to us thought that um, they needed to file with the Human Relations Commission as well as the EEOC, et cetera. 
Um, so I did send them a letter letting them know that we didn't have any um, authority over um, employment discrimination claims. Um, there was one where a woman feels like she experienced um, discrimination at a restaurant, but she's already in litigation with that restaurant. Um, she thought that um, our subpoena power could help her um, get access to information that she wanted or needed. Um, but I think because she's already in litigation, it's, um, it's beyond something that we could help with and our subpoena powers are really limited to fair housing. Um, there was a landlord tenant issue and then there was also a consumer protection issue. Somebody wanted to file a complaint against a business um, and so I provided them information on how to do that. Okay, I um, wanna thank you for a complete uh, report and uh, glad you had a good time in Sedona. Thanks. Um, I now want to go to uh, uh, County Council updates, uh, Commissioner Daydoni. I'm muting, yes. Um, the next County Council meeting on the 21st, as I recall, is going to have two um, actions that are relevant to the Human Relations Commission. Um, the agenda shows that the appointment of Commissioner Jaquela Hall will be voted on, Jaquela Hall will be voted on at the meeting on the 21st. There will also be a resolution introduced. Um, it was initiated by Councilwoman Rothian, uh, which is an apology for the um, anti-civil rights actions of a former county executive. Um, if you are following some of the discussions on social media, you will know, or if you've been here long enough, you'll, you'll know who the county executive was and who was, um, which civil rights leaders that county executive had um, surveilled. Um, but neither the county, former county executive, nor the persons who were the subjects of his um, efforts are named and there is um, dissatisfaction by at least one of the persons who was um, targeted uh, calling for a um, for naming the parties involved. Uh, so that might be interesting. There is also um, an indication that um, County Councilman Volke may introduce a bill opposing um, teaching using critical race theory or teaching critical race theory in the county. Um, this would not apply, my understanding is it would not apply to the school system. My certainty is that critical race theory is not taught at the AACPS level. Um, it is a college level course and I have had the opportunity to hear a, a presentation by the uh, executive director of the Office of Equity and Accelerated Student Achievement, who has a standard response because she receives a lot of questions about, are you teaching critical race theory in Anne Arundel County? And, and the answer is no, it is a theory, it is appropriate subject matter at the college level, not at the high school level. Uh, so I think those three items will be of interest. Not certain that um, Councilman Volke will introduce the bill, but he might. Okay, um, uh, any commissioners, uh, I, don't, I just think that's good for us to monitor and understand these uh, uh, actions, but I don't, I don't see any uh, action that we should take at this time. I'm willing to listen, but I don't perceive there's anything we should do at this time. Okay, hearing uh, no response to my inquiry, I'll go to uh, my report. Uh, I uh, couldn't get this on our last agenda. Uh, it actually happened in May. I gave a presentation to the Anne Arundel County uh, NAACP chapter. And part of the discussion that uh, Major Goodwin had earlier related to a request that they made for the hate bias statistics, 
which I asked uh, uh, Major for. Major sent them to me. I sent them on to the NAACP. They then informed me they were going to do an article in their newsletter about it. And that's when Major Goodwin sent me uh, a very detailed email with the state statistics that she gives, uh, that she provides and said, so we don't have um, any confusion. Please uh, send this to the NAACP and ask them to use the state statistics. And with that in mind, I both sent that information to uh, uh, the chair of the county chapter of the NAACP, Jacqueline Alsop, and uh, called her and talked with her about it. So they're aware of the difference in the statistics and uh, how they decided to portray it in their newsletter, that's up to them. But I did practice due diligence there. Um, I haven't had any additional requests. I'd like to go now to old business. Um, and we're going to take final action on a request that we got to co-sponsor a plaque um, commemorating uh, the murder or the death of uh, Nan Arundel County citizen, Mr. Peary, um, from the Caucus of African American Leaders. Um, I have sent you twice uh, information on this issue. Um, and um, I want to explain for complete transparency um, what I have sent. Um, I did some research and I sent you two newspaper articles from 1981. One considered the trial, which ended up in a verdict of not guilty for the uh, Anne Arundel County police officer, Officer Hodge, and uh, a uh, article which described the incident and the differing uh, versions of how it happened and what occurred. Um, I also sent you um, the uh, advice which Commissioner After, and I must say that Commissioner After would like to be here tonight, but he had uh, an emergency, uh, an injury to his ankle, and he had to go to the emergency room. So that's why he's not here. But if I could speak to what he requested, he requested that we go to the Office of Law and get uh, an opinion, an advisory. Uh, I sent you the advisory and the Office of Law gave us advice, advice on how they perceive um, our involvement in uh, the issuance of the plaque. Uh, the final thing I sent which was requested by Commissioner After, and I would have summarized this as I'm doing now to you, but I sent it out on his request, was the communication that um, Dr. K had with um, Mr. Snowden, Carl Snowden, the charity uh, of African American leaders on how the county executives saw our role and I must say that when I communicated to you and said that, unfortunately, and, and communicated to Mr. Snowden, unfortunately, we couldn't be involved. I based that on the advice of counsel, which is narrow. And as um, was pointed out in uh, uh, the communication that Dr. Case sent out, um, we have the ability to go beyond that advice and decide if this is an action we want to take, given um, the consideration of all the information that we've talked about before. And um, so what I'm gonna do at this point in time, having prefaced all that, is to um, ask our interim HRO to uh, uh, go through uh, the issues as she saw them and then I'll ask the commissioners to weigh in. So Joel, could you go and do that after I gave this rather long-winded explanation of why I sent all that information out to the commission and then we'll get com commissioner input and then we'll take a vote. I'd be happy to. So I'll preface what I have to say by saying that we're all learning as we go, right? 
This commission um, is a new commission and um, we're all figuring out what the role is and how, how it all comes together. So <clears throat> that being said, the way that I understand, do you want to ask a question, Mr. Popsaddle, or do you want to wait till I'm finished? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the request came to the commission, the Human Relations Commission, to do a commemorative plaque um, regarding um, an individual who um, lost his life in 1981. Uh, the way that Mr. Peterson explained it and what happened is that you had a discussion about the request. Then we got, you requested an opinion from the Office of Law in terms of whether this was within your scope of, of practice or work. Um, essentially, um, the way, what law came back and said was the code doesn't say you can or cannot do this. So you could read between the lines and make your own choice about what you want to do. Um, I think the factors that are important to consider is um, if, if we do one plaque, will that become a request that is often given to the Human Relations Commission? Um, and uh, as you can see with this one and the articles that Mr. Peterson sent, um, there definitely will have to be some sort of uh, looking at each request and um, you know, I, I just would suggest that you consider that in terms of um, whether it's something that you want to take on as a commission, um, the work that might go into um, processing such a request, honoring some, maybe not honoring others, et cetera, or if you really want the focus of your work to be something different. Um, <clears throat> so that being said, I think that um, the decision is up to the commission. The commission was the one that approved the request. Um, given the information that you have from the Office of Law, your own code, um, and then the background information that Mr. Peterson provided, um, I think that you should vote on what the commission wants to do um, with this request. Did I miss anything, Mr. Peterson? No, I was very concise and thank you for clarifying uh, uh, Office of Law uh, uh, involvement. Sure. Commissioner Clapsaddle, were you? Okay, Mary, Commissioner Dodoni, did you have a question? And not a question. Um, when we are ready to share our perspectives and, and contribute to finding a resolution together, I do wish to participate. Okay. I hand it back over to Eugene. Probably. Yes. Um, at this point in time, um, I'd ask uh, each individual commissioner to share their perspective uh, on where they are with this, and then we'll take a vote. If, if I may speak? Yes. Chairman Peterson, thank you. Um, our discussion last meeting was robust. That caused me to see things more thoroughly because of the robustness of that discussion. And I came to realize that it was easy to see as a one story. Policeman kills an African American man. But we weren't there. We cannot rejudge it. We don't know what the evidence was at the time. I believe that we are, I feel morally bound to operate to my best understandings of the burden of proof. And there's no way I could find that information. So a plaque that presumed the extrajudicial murder of a man of color is not something I could support. But we know that such things happen. And there's every reason to believe that they could have and perhaps did happen in Anne Arundel County. And to ignore that is also something I cannot support. So I'm looking for a path towards 
truth telling, or at least hearing each other's pain, which is where I was at the last meeting. Commissioner Aftar said we can't do anything about pain, everybody hurts. Yet, two days ago, maybe, yeah, two days ago, the group known as Connecting the Dots um, put up a lynching plaque where there was evidence and held conversations around that plaque. And the conversations weren't necessarily about guilt, but they were about how do you feel about this? What has this done to you? How are you changed? And those conversations were um, facilitated through the group, group known as Coming to the Table. We worked before with the Conflict Resolution Center to host a, a community meeting just before COVID where we heard stories and had conversations. I believe that that addressing of pain, hearing each other's stories, honoring each other's stories could be and should be within our purview. That's all I have to contribute at this time. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in? I think I'm, I'm kind of torn because I knew Mr. Perry. I knew, I mean, I know his children. Um, I knew the type of person that he was. And so I would be kind of biased because I believe that his, his daughter's account of what happened, that her father would not have done what he was accused of having done. So I'm, I'm, I'm really torn. And, and, you know, given the climate that we're in, knowing that this happens time and time and time again. So, you know, uh, going on with Mary said, it, it, we, Commissioner Dedong said, we, you know, we have to find a way to address this as a commission. I don't think that we can just be solid about it. Um, but I'm torn about, like I said, I'm torn about the plaque itself because I feel that I am a little biased because I know the family personally. So I'm not sure that in, I, you know, in all good conscience, I could, I could take a vote on saying to go one way or the other, because if I were forced to do a vote, I would say that we would go along with what the request was of us. Um, okay. And, you know, and then knowing, you know, if my understanding is that the um, the case was moved out of out of county, looking at the makeup of the jury and all those types of things, is it just it really bothers me, and I don't think that um, I don't I don't from a personal perspective I don't think that um, a fair trial was had, um, just based on, you know based on all the facts that I know and based on me knowing the family and Mr. Perry personally. But we can't remain silent. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Clapsaddle, do you have anything to add? Yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> Mary, uh, Commissioner Didoni, I, I, I certainly appreciate your always thoughtful considerations. Um, however, in this case, I would not agree to withhold my support for such a letter and such a plaque. And in terms of uh, Ms. Ridgeway's concern about if we do one plaque, are we gonna get to do a lot of plaques? Um, I think we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, this is such a heartbreaking case. And these, this family has held this hurt within them for so many years that I think if we do anything, if we have any courage, I would suggest two things. One, that we approve supporting this plaque. And two, that we don't just stop there, but go back to what Mary's suggestion is that we create a path. Because I think it's important that we create a path whether it's the black movement or the gay movement or whatever it is, we have to have a path forward. So that's my feeling. Um, I, um, uh, I've done some in this case and I, and I really, I, even though I didn't live here at the time, but it, too much has gone on. And I think that we, 
we have a responsibility as a commission to recognize this family. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I guess uh, at this point, Mary, are there any other commissioners besides the ones that have spoken and are on the call right now? No. Okay. It's the four of us. It's the four of us. Okay. It's an intimate group. Um, I just uh, would say um, one of the things that I didn't say that I sent to you was the fact that um, I asked the uh, Major Goodwin to look into it, and she found that um, Officer Hodge was reinstated, and he retired two years later. And, and I would imagine he retired with a full pension. Um, and that was the end of that was the end end of his uh, involvement in the department's involvement, and I imagine they reinstated him because of the uh, uh, not guilty verdict. I would assume, but uh, uh, the major did not send me that. Uh, uh, she just sent the information that he was reinstated. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Can I say something else? Also, if we look at it, um, with you know, a lens from a rear, a rear, rear, view, rear view mirror, um, and put it in, in today's time, I think that a trial would have been a lot different. Um, looking from 1981 to, to 2021, you know, we can say that not much has changed, but I still think the trial, the trial would have, would have been a lot different. I think that more evidence would have been brought forward. Um, based on the articles that you sent, um, the officer had been involved in a couple other um, incidents. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that, that would have weighed in on a fair and impartial um, jury's decision. I just can't, in all good conscience, say that that he got, as a, as the, the deceased person, got a fair shake. Um, I think that things were even more so um, pro officer back then and if the officer said it happened this way then it must have happened that way and other things would not have been considered that may be considered today maybe but I you know I think that's that we need to do something because yeah. we, just, we just can't be silent about it and as Commissioner Clapsettle said um, you know it's just one case at a time like anything that you do regardless of what it is it's always situational so if we were able to move forward with the support for this particular crack, the next one, based on the circumstances, we may say, you know, it doesn't warrant the support. We just don't know. It's the case by case situation. And we have, I think we have to weigh it that way. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Claps, how do you have more to, that you want to uh, say? I just wanted to add one other thing. I have been pondering this George Floyd situation and the trial of the officer. And I just, 20 years ago, we didn't have phone cameras that could take this. Because I think if that young woman had not taken the pictures, that that officer would not have been convicted. So that's why I'm a little bit more open to honoring um, um, this request from Ms. Brown. Um, and I agree with Commissioner uh, Gaskin that the times have changed and it would be a different outcome today, I think. But I, that's why I'm, I'm stating that. So I'm, I'm going to support, uh, I would support a motion to, to uh, approve the plaque. Thank you. Okay, um, any further discussion, debate, I guess, uh, Yes, please. I would like to. Okay. Thank yes. Thank you. All right. Um, thank goodness for the young lady who took the videos of uh, George Floyd's death. Um, as someone who sat in the murder trial <clears throat> against um, Mr. Sean Urbanski, um, for Colonel Collins, not Colonel Collins, I'm sorry. I'm losing it because it was very hard to see. Um, 
for the Collins son, I'm not so sure that there would have been a different outcome without that video. And we are in the position of not having the video and knowing something wrong happened. I believe that is worth commemorating, acknowledging, um, making others aware of. I question how we do it in the absence of compelling evidence such as a video without saying there were equally good part people on both sides. For recognizing the story and allowing those who read the plaque to have to engage with it viscerally and intellectually without spoon feeding them a conclusion. I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if that's the way you want to go. And it may be sufficient to say that, you know, at, at this location on this day, Mr. Leroy Prairie, who was a respected and loved member of the community, was killed by an officer with prior history of assault. The officer was found not guilty in an out of county trial in 1981. If that's enough of the story, or if, what you want to say. Um, yeah, well, that would be something we would work out in collaboration with the, the caucus if we decide to do this. Um, any other discussion, debate? Okay, I guess uh, we'll go ahead and take a vote on this. Can I just make a suggestion yes i don't know whether you want to tr do a vote by email only because if you would end up with a tie tonight i don't i'm not saying that you would but if you put it to vote and you don't have say you might know the rules better than i i think i think that's um a good suggestion if we could do it that we could get every, even if you do a call meeting, just for the for this, just point, for the vote, as soon as yeah. possible. Yeah. Okay. So that way, it's you know it represents the whole commission, but then also yes. in the event you know you have an even number, it's usually why you have an odd number on a commission so that you don't end up with a tie or anything. Right. No, that's a good. That's a good point. That's, that's a very good point. Given. Well, I want to just remind everyone that I don't think you can make votes through email so the call the vote would definitely have to be through a call okay yeah we could do it through a call yeah um what about the use of voting software and i wish i could remember the name of it but it's something like ballot buddy um that i know the naacp vetted and used and other organizations were using during covid um for uh, voting it, it's a vetted, validated piece of software. Yeah, I think a lot of the rules were um, had, were suspended, or they had temporary emergency rules in place during COVID. And technically, we are still in the state of emergency until July first. <laughs> right. So. Um. Mm. We. Uh, well, it's the seventeenth. I mean, there's still a week, you know, there's still almost two weeks before July 1st. Not that that, that, but I think we could, you could call a meeting um, for the vote. Yeah, we could so call a meeting for the vote. I think yep. this is important enough to get everybody on record. That's what I was hoping would happen tonight. That's why I sent the notice out twice. So um, um, given all of that, um, we, we can, and I guess uh, uh, I'd ask for um, a vote on calling a meeting within uh, the next two weeks. And it would be, uh, would it be a Zoom meeting or would we record it by Zoom? Is that the idea? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we did do a recorded meeting and have a recorded vote on uh, uh, the co-sponsoring of the plaque. Um, is there a motion to do that? I would I would ask Miss Gaston to make that motion if she would be so kind. 
I know that Commissioner Peterson calls a meeting of the entire commission to take a vote on co-sponsoring the fact that Mr. Perry, along with the Office of Black and American Leaders, within the next two weeks. Yes. Is there a second? I'm happy to second that motion. Okay. It's been properly moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, the ayes have it. Okay, I'll get with Joel. Uh, we'll communicate by email uh, and we'll uh, get a date and uh, send the notice out and we'll call it a mandatory meeting because I would really like to get everybody involved in this. <laughs> I think it's important that we speak as a, as a total commission and uh, if people aren't available then um i forget how the voting works on that but um uh they would be considered a, a non-vote i guess but the bottom line is you, if we have a quorum uh, of commissioners present then we'll take a vote and those that aren't present will be shown as absent not voting that's the way it'll be if that makes sense is that's pretty much the way it works right Faye? I believe so, unless they can vote by proxy, but I'll have to check to see what right. the bylaws are. Yeah, no, I and think it permits that. I'm not sure. If yeah, it's... I think they, they would be designated absent, not vote. Okay. okay. All right. Um, now we'll move on to, uh, I don't think we have any new business. Wait, wait, wait uh, Commissioner sure. Clapp oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. I, I, keep, I, keep ra I keep raising. I'm sorry. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. You're still muted. Uh, no, it happened again. There you go. Commissioner uh, Peterson, uh, regarding uh, this uh, support of the plaque, do we need to have at this meeting a motion developed for this vote that we're going to take on the uh, on later on or will we just get a motion on that occasion i think we can have a motion on that occasion okay because we've had extensive debate and discussion we'll have and I, for everybody so that they know what we're voting on and they've had mm -hmm. numerous emails on this to begin with and you guys just voted on essentially doing that right right so. the second thing if if you would be so kind as your privilege here um uh, I would like to thank this commission for their support um, of the uh, LGBTQ plus coalition with the uh, Anne Arundel County Board of Education. Um, after three hearings, uh, the board voted last night six to two to approve this uh, measure. Uh, it is evolutionary. It is not something that's going to be solve every problem. But this is Pride Month, and those of us who are uh, gay and have lived with discrimination in our lives, uh, we recognize that this is a major achievement. Uh, I, I don't know whether this is appropriate or not, uh, uh, Chair Peterson, but I would like to express my extreme disappointment uh, regarding the Board of Education last evening when it comes to discrimination. Um, there was one no vote that was by um, uh, uh, that was by a member Corkadell, and I felt that she represented on a very important level serious discrimination. And Corinne Frank, um, I'm sorry, Corkadell Corkadell abstained. I'm sorry. Uh, Frank voted no, but I felt also that the president, uh, Melissa Ellis, lost control of the meeting at one point, and she was trying to ride the middle of the fence, and, and it was not appropriate. And it was obvious from the participation of not only myself but others that this was a clumsy effort. So 
when we vote for Board of Education members, we need to go into depth uh, regarding their ability to look at our schools, our students, and have compassion for issues. Mm -hmm. Point well, well taken. Um, I think at this time, um, there's no action that we would take as a commission, but your thoughts and your views are well uh, expressed and, and well regarded by the commission. Um, at this point in time, uh, having no new business, um, we will uh, uh, have a special meeting um, um, in a couple couple of weeks to uh, um, uh, dispose of the uh, uh, period plaque uh, request. And um, at that meeting, too, we'll... Uh, also decide whether uh, we would, uh, and, and we also will have to have a third meeting in July, third uh, week in July uh, meeting, because that's when we need to consider the uh, proposed uh, uh, regulations so that we can have a hearing if we need to have a hearing on a housing discrimination complaint, which we have. So we will have a need to have uh, a meeting in July um, for that purpose. So um, um, if there isn't anything else on the agenda, are there any items for the good of the order that any of the commissioners have? Okay, hearing. Uh, and I, I just, oh, go ahead. if I could, I yeah. just wanna jump in and say that um, one of the things that I appreciate the most about this group is um, the thought and care and consideration that you give to the issues that are before you. Um, you can hear it and see it in all of you and the passion that you have for this work. And um, I think that as a county, we are really fortunate to have a group of people um, that are doing such great work. So I just wanna thank you for that and being very thoughtful about this request because I think it's, I think it's important. Um, and um, I'm just appreciative of how you're working through it and these other sort of, we're building the plane as we fly it uh, kind of things. Thank you for those uh, comments. Uh, HRO Ridgeway, um, well uh, said. And um, are there any other comments uh, for the good of the order? Okay, hearing none, um, I would like to, uh, at this point, uh, ask for, um, given the fact that we know that we're gonna have the interim meeting to finalize the uh, uh, Caucus of African American Leaders plaque re request for honoring Mr. Perry and his family, and that we will have a meeting uh, the third uh, Thursday in July, to uh, uh, after we've looked at them, um, adopt uh, our rules for uh, housing discrimination hearings, um, and um, um, then we'll uh, also dis discuss whether we would have a meeting in August or move to uh, cancel that and have a meeting in September. Um, so. That's where we are uh, now. Any other items for the good of the order? That's a summary of where, where we will be in the next few weeks. Okay, hearing none, I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Daydoni. Is there a second? Second. Is that uh, Commissioner Gaston? Yes. Okay, seconded by Commissioner Gaston. Um, it's a non-debatable motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All right. Um, thank you all and thank those who are uh, with us uh, by Zoom. And uh, we'll see you at the next meeting. Thank you, everyone.